So here we have part two of the design review with Mark on the Continentals for 1972. If you haven't yet seen part one, I'll put the link in the description to ensure that you can enjoy the full experience and design walk around. Okay, we're back talking about the Continentals for 72. Mark, let's talk a little bit more about the details that both unite and differentiate these two vehicles. Yes, there's some interesting stuff to look at here. We already talked about these uh, smoothly integrated shapes, like integrating the bumper shapes and what led to the five mile per hour bumper laws that these were very flush. These are two very different interpretations of the same approach. Uh, one is more in character with what the Mark IV was trying to do, and one is more in character with what the uh, regular Lincoln Continental was trying to do. If you look at the integration of the reflectors, which by law were required to be on the side, visible from the side of the car, I have a separate lens that's very slim mm. and very, very elongated on, on the Mark IV, which is in keeping with that very um, slim and, and formal tone of the car that's also very reduced. You have it integrated here in the massive side wing of the bumper. Even though both bumpers are integrated in the overall shape of the fender wing, you have a very different, more massive uh, integration, which is in keeping with that sort of massive formality theme. And then you look at the way the tail lamps are done. We have a similar approach. We have a little uh, silver framing around right. the red lens, but it's all very sharp corners, sharp angles. Again, massive formality, very large. You go to the Mark IV, and you have the same basic approach, however, you have a lot of radii and you have it softer and the whole thing is scaled down. And both cars have the tail lamps in the bumper, which was a fad that started in the late 60s. A very beautiful fad, I might add. I love the cars with integrated tail lamps in the bumper. On this one, it's a little higher. And it's also interesting that because this is based on the Torino, 19... Uh, 72 changed where the fuel uh, <coughs> tank sits. You still have the side uh, filler because your fuel tank is above the rear axle or, or behind the rear axle. Right. On my car, it used to be there in 1969 with the Mark III because the Thunderbird had the same arrangement, but the Torino's, the mid sizes, had it under the trunk. So yeah. you have a center filler, which, which is, is one of the worst low. locations yeah. because I, if I ever ran out of gas and with the fuel economy of this car, you <laughs> will run out of gas. I can't fill it from a reserve canister. I had to make, a friend of mine made a special bracket that I could put a big funnel into so I can actually fill this because you will not get the nozzle of a uh, conventional sort of uh, a reserve canister in there and you will not be able to fill the it's it's well, don't incredibly run out of gas. don't run out of gas which is hard to do with this car <laughs> i mean they both have 460s yeah. they both have four, four sixties, the uh, the small controlled 460s yes. so they're 212 uh, 212 horse horsepower that's yes right. which uh, but enough torque to move a mountain so they still move along quite nicely but again here uh, the difference being that there is a lot more softness, a lot more radii. So the, the, the character of the Mark IV was a little softer, a lot more roundness in the be uh, general body contours and the way the wheelhouses are done, the overall tumble home of the car. That is so much more Tornado-esque. Yes, to and, and absolutely. skirtless fenders, yes, opposed to skirted yes. fenders. So it has that approach. Whereas on, on the uh, Continental Coupe, the, the Lincoln Continental Coupe, you have more massiveness. You have square shapes, you have blockier shapes. Even though there's some softness in the way the roof line is done, that's about the only area of the car that's, that's more sensual. The rest of the car is actually quite sheer and, and blocky and has much more severe shapes than uh, the Mark IV does. And then, of course, you have one of my favorite uh, kitsch details, which is this thing here, um, which already the Mark II Continentals had in 1956, and there was no spare tire under there. It's just for styling. One of those things that's, to a designer, a guilty pleasure. I love it. Um, the fact that it has the serif font that's uh, s spaced out over the, the arc. Big, of the, se large serifs as well there. Um, relatively, well, they're not much bigger than the actual detailing. Well, in terms of the serif, the... Uh, the uh, oh, the, the actual font style. Yes, yes very large serif uh, uh, font. And uh, interestingly enough, that's the biggest lettering on the car. The, uh, Mark, the Mark IV is actually the smallest lettering on the car. You don't have that. so. They're playing up the continental part in this clearly by spelling it out in block letters, whereas you have a few scripts, but this one spells it out in block letters. Which later, interestingly, they did spell out, I think it was Lincoln in the front in 74 of I this I think one. so. That, that's always one of those things where they played around with the facelets. What do we do this year? You know, that sort of thing. So that was one of them. But that became an absolutely vital trademark execution that Ford milked and bilked on a number of vehicles <laughs> down to Mercury, Cougars, and whatnot in the later 70s. Pretty pretty uh, nifty stuff. 
And interesting that your Lincoln logo is on the side too. It's it's laid sideways on the deck lid of the it Lincoln is. Continental, which is kind of a strange <laughs> inconsistency of the approach. Yeah, I have no idea because it, it's totally incongruent with all the other emblems. Yeah, the it's just I don't know why they would have done that. I, I can only guess, probably because they didn't have enough space vertically or so. It's I don't know. They have not space. It's, it's uh, <laughs> just strange that they would do that because that breaks the corporate identity uh, theme a little bit. You know. Um, no idea why they would do that. This car actually has, I think, three different, minimally three different, maybe yeah. if, the, if you look at, yeah, three different yeah. Lincoln logos. This one, yeah. the wheel cover is kind mm -hmm. of the older style Lincoln yeah. logo. And then you have the hood, which doesn't have as much of the points yeah. on it. The Mark series was more consistent and more vertically oriented, slimmer, Lugs, and yes. it was more consistent throughout the vehicle. Um, and then we have, you know, uh, my Kitsch, Kitsch Q number two that I hate to like, but I actually ended up liking it. I, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of upper windows in this car because of the massive seat pillar. It actually does help with visibility. Especially because you, you don't have a passenger mirror. I, I don't have a, neither do you. So yeah, This it helps. one does, but somebody added oh, it. It's a dealer added. add on. Oh, that's right. You have, they have yeah, a separate But one, it yeah. was not a factory, yeah. factory installed. Yeah, um, that was very uncommon to have a passenger side mirror. And, and uh, this actually does help when you're backing out of parking spaces to see uh, people and things through it. It's a massive C pillar. I think it was an $80 option and then it became standard. It became standard. You could delete it and the word is that in 72 at least, about 18% of the vehicles produced did not have it. I, I have no source that actually verifies that. I read this somewhere uh, years ago. Um, but about 18, no, less than one-fifth of total production do not have the opera window. Uh, another peculiarity with the opera window is that it restricts the rearward travel of the rear quarter window. This is as far back as it goes. So this is a hardtop that can't be turned into a true hardtop. <laughs> Which is funny, the, in the Continental, the glass goes down. Drops Here down. it retracts, Correct. but it this, stops because it yeah. hits into the Exactly, so the glass uh, panel is about here in the mechanism and it stops up against the oval shape, the cutout of the opera window. If you have opera window delete, of course, then you have a true hardtop because that quarter window can fully retract rewards. Well, you have to suffer for styling. I remember a friend was operating mine. He said, well, your rear, rear window's broken. It only goes <laughs> yes. back an inch. Like, no, that's... It's eh. not the window that's broken. It's the philosophy that was broken. <laughs> but uh, yes. That's right, yes. <laughs> well, this car is full of peculiar little quirks that are the result of the styling because we already talked about the smooth bumper integration, how that led to the five mile per hour bumper laws. This car is a poster child of what, for many years, right or wrong, the rest of the world has criticized in American cars. It's all styling and no substance. It makes a lot of compromises necessary to suffer for this extreme proportion. If you look at the more personal approach here, the roof line is lower, on top of which it has a very low window line. There's quite a bit of roof thickness here. It is a thick roof. Absolutely. It's a thick roof and you have very little, vert it's not even a foot of window height here. So it's a very personal, close coupled um, feeling when you sit in there, almost claustrophobic. Such a contrast to the European cars like the Opel Record coupes with the very thin Or roof. even just take a contemporary Mercedes with the very tall uppers and, and lots of glass. Um, so this was all about the styling. This looks a little bit customized and chopped a little bit, a little chopped and channel that was intended to be that way. And it's uh, basically just done for looks. There's no other reason. <laughs> it's, it's just to give, the, give this appearance and it comes with compromises. The trunk is an absolute yeah. ridiculous compromise. Let's take a look at your Let's trunk. Let's take a look at the trunk. And uh, I took the junk out of the trunk because there really isn't that much room for any junk anyway. I'll so open if you're the hauling trunk stuff. my car as well. Give yes. So here we see one of these lovely little details, which is the little spring mounted uh, cover uh, under the emblem, which is a very nice idea. It's not uh, done anymore because we don't open doors and, and deck lids like this. But here's a trunk. That's my little case here and it's surprisingly small because you can't even put one standard size suitcase in here. There's, there's not enough room here. It's about a foot and not even a foot and a half. I would say about 14, 15 inches. That suitcase would not fit there laying down. Uh, it would think. not fit here laying down. We can try this. I've got this uh, hooked up with a bungee cord and and this is, by the way, it has a trailer hitch on it, so there's actually the correct uh, connection for the, for the uh, electrical. Yeah, it does not fit. And this is a small attache case. This is not a big, this is not a big I do uh, it to people always say, oh, well, that trunk's a huge trunk. And yeah. this car's no. not. If you, if you are a member of um, uh, a secret society and you want to get rid of the evidence, make sure that your victims are tiny. 
or dismembered. Because, uh, or, well, no, that makes a mess on the carpet. <laughs> but it's a very small trunk with a very inconvenient placement of the spare, and that's all part of the uh, packaging glory of the Torino. Especially so different from this, which has the deep well the trunk. The deep well the because fuel the fuel tank, tank is forward. Yeah. It's, it's behind the rear axle. The filler is on the side. Uh, it is a deep well trunk. You can stand up, I would say, two big suitcases in the middle and then lots of smaller bags. So this is probably this trunk is not only at least twice the size, but it's probably infinitely more usable. This car did come from New Jersey, so you don't know whatever, you know, was in the trunk. Uh, we don't, <laughs> we didn't see anything. We didn't hear anything. That's right. So. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, yes, but this, uh, what's nice about these is they're very nicely finished. And, uh, you know, it's full, fully carpeted. They have a nice piece of garnish trim here. It's quite, quite robust. And there's carpeting everywhere, a cover for the spare tire. That's a little bit, I mean, for the money you have to pay. That's I like how they even have the cover over this. Yes, of the center. Yeah, there's a little point. cover over that. So it's actually quite nicely finished. Um, and uh, what's also very, very nice is, of course, that the closures and the metal work, the body work on these cars is wonderful because everything sounds great, everything feels great when you close. It's very minimal it effort, it's very precise feeling. People also say, well, the cars were poorly built to this era. These Lincolns were not, I mean. Not the Wixom built cars, The no. gaps on yours and mine are yeah. just about. The paint I mean, quality is excellent. Uh, look at the, how smooth the reflections flow on the body side. If you look at how the, you always have a little bit of busyness and action in the reflections here because the metal always, uh, has some witness of the hem flanges and it's very difficult to tune that even on modern cars It's something we spend a lot of time on in the dies and the, in the uh, trial stampings okay. to make sure you get as smooth as possible reflection This car is almost absolutely perfect. It's flawless the door fit no sag in the door um, the way they close is wonderful it's low effort and and uh, the build quality on these was much better than the reputation of American car uh, cars usually allows for We'll get to the interior in a moment and the unique power door lock that activates by only by pulling that up yes. and pushing it down. Interesting. Well, very cool. All right, let's, let's talk about the interiors of the two vehicles. So different, not only in terms of the space, but the themes. The yeah, themes. very much so. The uh, regular uh, two-door or coupe uh, Lincoln Continental has a very... Uh, horizontally oriented uh, symmetrical interior theme. The interesting thing is that it has a, a peculiar racetrack motif where you have a secondary channel that is an inverted horseshoe, like an inverted U, that sets up the entire bank of instruments and terminates in the outlets on the extreme, the, the, uh, the air conditioning outlets at the extreme end. And then it has a sort of a bolstered secondary element that's very massive. So it has an interesting um, interesting recognizable theme for the interior so it's a very themed uh, interior which is not always priority in these cars it's usually the materials and and some of the detailing but this one has a very strong emphasis on a uh, graphic theme which uh, was often copied by other manufacturers and I think one of the more recent copies was the <laughs> VW Magellan show car in the early 2000s. Still they being copied. Yeah. yeah, still being copied. They took exactly that approach and, and turned it into their interior motif. Um, and there's a couple of Chrysler products that had a similar theme. This was something that, that this car is very strong on, the, uh, the graphic uh, theme of how everything sort of racetracks from here, runs across the speedometer and comes down the other side, very symmetrical, but then also very driver. Uh, friendly by clustering the gauges uh, in front of the. You do have a full complement of gauges. Yes, here it is a full complement of gauges, which the Mark IV does not have. That's right. Coolant yeah. temperature, oil pressure, yeah. and the Mark III had mm -hmm. that as well. Then the door cards themselves, the door trim panels, fairly conventional, surprisingly so, very simple. Um, not much uh, molded other than the armrest, not much molded in here. Um, a nice insert with uh, cloth, but pretty standard execution, a profusion of buttons and switches. It wasn't very ergonomic. Having the controls on the door was a, was a bit of progress because before, when the controls were not on a horizontal panel, they were much more awkwardly placed often. So Ford was one of the pioneers of placing all the power accessory controls uh, on the armrest like that, and that was definitely a step forward compared to the vertical orientation when the power window switch banks were just vertically up against the uh, door panel, for instance. Some of the lower end cars, I think the LTD still had that because they would yeah. use the crank window hole. Yes, exactly, the access exactly, point. access yeah. for, the, for the wiring and so forth, exactly. And uh, the other thing that's maybe interesting to note here is that you have a 
really, really ecclesiastical looking brocade. It's something <laughs> that almost, this is very funeral parlor. <laughs> I, and this is uh, definitely one of the simpler treatments if I think of some of your Mercury's, your Marquis. And yeah, that's they fair. They are actually more elaborate on the interior than this car. They are, they, they are. Now this does have a super soft, very padded seat. I think the mm -hmm. the softest seat that I've sat in from the era even is it the way from the that way from the factory? Do you is think that it just way. collapsed <laughs> over time and created no, a butt a, pocket? No, it's it's supportive. It's not okay. creating. It, it's actually it's pretty supportive, but it's uh, yeah. With these cars, it's hard to tell what is where and what is actual intent from the factory, right. especially with foam, as foam changes the rometer and elasticity over. It's over very the comfortable. Yeah, it's very comfortable. Yeah, this is definitely a massive car. It doesn't have, as usual, not that much leg room in the back, but it certainly has a lot of width and, and, and very spacious feeling. And the uh, roof is higher, the glass is taller, so it's a much airier cabin than the Mark IV. They do have one Easter egg that I'll show in a separate picture, but these lights in the C-pillar actually have the little Lincoln logo in them. Oh, they do. Which was, what do I, mine have? I don't know if yours has it no, or not. I don't, I have, I have only the, uh, the dome dome, swiveling dome light, so. Yeah. yeah. The, but this, so Ford used the same light for many years, but on these, the little white uh, oh, lens has a Lincoln logo in it. Yeah, it's interesting that this car is really actually fairly reduced and not as uh, plush as some of the Mercury's. It's not, you know, even to the point where this is hard plastic, mm -hmm. to access the switch, you pull, you pry this but, plastic panel But off. you have something that the Mercury's probably don't. You have a fine simulation of wood Oh. The look, the rich look of whatever this simulated wood, wood. Yeah. Yeah. On your on your door release handle. That's now, right. That's yeah. that's that's that where is, the money goes. That is luxury, right? Yeah, yeah so, for sure. I mean, they were <laughs> they were juggling uh, all kinds of little trinkets. I mean, designers and 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 the color and trim people always want to get more into the car, and then you guys come along and say, no, 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 we never, no. That's right. exactly. So we never said that. It's always a struggle to get uh, content into but the you, vehicles. You do get to your point when you close the door. Well, I have to give it a little more. Let's give, it a, than that. give it a proper nudge. Yeah. But yeah. It's lovely. It sounds great. It fits beautifully. It does. And uh, yeah, it's a very, very nice execution of the bodywork. Let's take a look at the Mark IV in here because it's so different. The theme. So, the first thing, I want you to direct your attention to this little lever here, which is the seat back release. And then clo close when I close the door, put it here. And let's see if we can get it into the picture. Yep. Oh, oh uh, no. no, no, not okay. quite. I guess. That's, that's, Ooh, that's tough. It's tough, right? But uh, when I open it... Yeah, try it again. Go okay. ahead now. Oh, it moves. Ah, it's connected. It's the it's an auto automatic seat uh, auto seat back release, electrically that connected. That is hilarious. Yep, and uh, that was one of the features where you had to secure the seat backs in those days of the early safety regulations because normally they were just free. Right. So now, by the late 60s, early 70s, you had to have some sort of retention. Yeah. And so this is an electric, very complicated system because people didn't want to have to f f fidget with a release lever. On the driver's side is a different approach. There's actually a little little uh, kick lever that uh, releases yes, it. Yes, yeah. Interesting. So this is connected to the dome lamp uh, wiring. And you have the kind of like a high back uh, split. It's split a edge. high back seat with an interesting shape of the headrest. If you look at your headrest, it's very standard. It's yes. a typical headrest. On the Mark IV, it is IV, the standard Ford yeah. and Mark On headrest. the Mark IV, it has an L shape. It it wraps behind the seat back. Which panel, Cadillac which is, had back which, then? Yeah, too. it was a more integrated, a little bit more personal look. Everything about this car is more personal. It certainly doesn't have any room inside. It's uh, kind of ridiculously no, the small. Back seat is. <laughs> it's tiny, tiny, but it's very luxurious looking so um, it's quite the uh, it's got shag carpet and um, it's a very very lovely looking uh, rear seat compartment with not much space because usually people don't hang out there and very the shag cool. carpet uh, has one major drawback other than its shag is it always looks a little bit messy along the edge because it has such a long uh, nap that uh, it always looks a little frayed along <laughs> the edges, but that's how they work. It's a shag, shag carpet is standard issue on these cars. Now more elaborate door panel, but you have kind of this hard plastic lower Yeah, piece so this is, things. as we were saying, they were phoning it in a little bit with the Mark IV. They were, they were cashing in on the tremendous success of the Mark III. The Mark III, you have one, you have a 70 Mark III, correct? 69. 69. And uh, that was a beautifully finished car with very, very rich materials. It was one of the best executed cars when it comes to interior quality and materials. The Mark IV, not so much. 
they were cashing in on the on the success of the Mark III. This is a Torino-based car. These materials are no better than you would get on any standard Ford. And uh, there's a little bit more, you know, there's a little ashtray here because smoking was important, you know. So there's an ashtray here for the rear seat passengers in the door because the door is so long. But other than that, it's fake wood. It's the vinyls are pretty standard issue. What's different in my car from most cars is it has a cloth interior, which uh, is yeah. a lovely uh, flat woven uh, material. The problem with cloth, of course, is it doesn't wear as nice as easily as leather. It's a little more sensitive. So this one I'm already going to have to start watching out for uh, the um, durability here because it certainly abrades and, and scuffs and doesn't wear so well like leather. And they had the uh, in true finance person uh, love here or love. They have dual fake wood. Dual fake wood, that's, I guess, part of the richness theme, <laughs> is that if, if, if one type of plastic doesn't do it for you, let's have two. Yes, this is um, part of the infamous picture framing era, where everything, in order to make it look more upscale, and uh, I guess that's what, that's what the reasoning was, they were chrome framing everything or bright framing everything. And if you wanted more, you just added more. You did a dual layer of uh, wood, of fake wood, and you have a very driver-centric cockpit. With uh, a Cartier clock. Uh, with a, of course, it's not, it's stuck like most old car clocks. Uh, the dirt and grime build up and the mechanism stops, so this one does not work. At the moment, um, yes, a Cartier face clock, uh, a little uh, co-branding to add more cachets, kind of like the Tiffany clock and the Olds. Uh, Regency. Well, then they would know. later go through the designer series. You know, right, the, the designer Blass series starting in 1974 and 5, I believe. I think it's that 75 or 6. I think it's 75 or 6. Yeah, I mean, 75 or 6. The various uh, fashion designers that, were, that lent their name and supposedly designed or chose the <laughs> interior term materials. I don't know how much of that was really true, but that was very popular and became the central selling motif for the Mark V series. You do have, this car did have standard, you can see there's a sure track light here, standard rear wheel ABS brakes. Yes, uh, that was also a thing of the uh, Continental uh, Mark series that they had a basically an anti-lock braking system for the rear uh, or a, a pressure limitation system to prevent these 5,000 pound barges going sideways across the freeway in an emergency stop. Um, it brakes quite well for its day. It's, I've never had a problem with the brakes. Um, the handling is... Um, shall we say leisurely, <laughs> um, because the but car the is, ride very ponderous. is very nice. The ride is very nice, uh, but these, these cars are much more ponderous than the contemporary Chrysler or GM product. It is. It's interesting, like you said. It's such a squinty greenhouse in here. The, the distance from the top of the dash to the roof line. Yes, is, it's very confining. Is it even a foot? It might not even be. It's a foot. barely a foot. I think it's like 10, 11 inches or something like this. Uh, it's very confining. It's a personal car. And uh, it has all the disadvantages of uh, a gigantic car with none of the advantages in space. <laughs> and that's a little bit of what made uh, American cars a bit problematic in the rest of the world, or to the rest of the world, is that they were so wasteful. But it also makes for the glorious uh, proportions and the fantastic appearance, of course. Plus, this dash overhang is relatively hefty. So when you're sitting as a driver, yeah, it's, you it's, don't have much you don't have much it's greenhouse very you have this dash very close to you they thought they could get away with that in this personalized package that it was the more exclusive car that was usually just driver and passenger and not really four or five people in it and five people could never fit any luggage even for a no, quick weekend yeah. trip in this car the glove box is even humorously small yes on everything this car. is sort I mean, of is inefficient is and sort that's of ridiculous the glove box. yeah I mean, which that is, is part of the charm points of this car is that it's actually ridiculous but it's it's a little bit like opera or something that's completely out uh, old fashioned and nobody needs it, but it's just wonderful. <laughs> you know, it's just wasteful and stupid, and that makes it so glorious. <laughs> and you have the super mouse fur headliner that Ford had. Yes, for that's a uh, that's actually years. quite nice. Uh, the whole motif, and that's why I like the cloth interiors, is very low gloss uh, and kind of subdued. It's it's not particularly flashy. And the fact that it's a black car with a red interior is, is very appealing to me. Very nice. Yeah, great door closures too. Yes. Like you said. And this is the power lock that I was mentioning before. You push it down, you can hear they're electric on this. Yes. 
But there is no other power lock switch. This is no, that was this a, peculiar, a wasn't it? Normally, yeah. I mean, even the earlier versions of different makes were a separate button on the uh, well, the Mark III was panel. too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I mean, if you wanted to unlock the door and you're sitting in the driver's seat, you have to reach Correct. back. On my Thunderbird, you. it was on the center console. Yeah. Or on the center line of car. Yes. I don't and, know why uh, they did that, but uh, it's it's some peculiarity. Uh, of this this particular car. This car has no power locks. I don't. I can't. Rec I think this one might have had it on the switch, but mm -hmm. but yeah. Very cool. All right. We'll do a little wrap up. One last look at the two front ends. They're so different, but both so. Uh, so different, but very stately and. They're out of the same stable for sure but they have different missions and they do it quite distinctly different. Um, the uh, Continental being more stealth, a little bit more mysterious, maybe an, an air of menace about it, but on a different, different package car. And then the uh, Lincoln Continental being just huge and massive and, and, and it plays the size for, for all it's worth. Um, a bit more conventional and a bit more expected, but also infinitely more practical. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Mark. That was a great overview, interior, exterior. Glad to have you back again on Rare Classic Cars. And uh, this is a one, two, three punch weekend for us because uh, we uh, reviewed the Pontiacs and we're doing this and tomorrow we're doing the Eyes on Design. So there's a lot of classic car uh, activity going on for us this weekend. That's right. So hope all of you enjoy. Mark was back by unpopular demand. <laughs> we'll have some more You're videos. You're on that again. That's right. We'll have some more videos from this weekend. Thanks again for watching. Mark, thank you again. Yeah, thanks for having me again, Adam. All right. Take care. Thanks for watching part two of the Continentals for 1972, the 1972 Mark IV, as well as the Lincoln Continental Coupe. If you haven't seen part one, I'll put the link in the description. Be sure that you watch it. And please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, as that will help the YouTube algorithm serve this up to more viewers like you. And hit the super thanks button, which is the heart-shaped icon with the dollar sign in it at the bottom right of your video browser if you really enjoyed the video. And until next time, be sure to check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, take care.